is are, monitor, are motoring, but they haven't got the total capacity yet. The next piece we need, and I, you, you'll know more about it than I do from listening to all the people who've submitted, we need to get local authorities driven to provide homes like they've been known to provide them in the past. Without that, I can't see any survival for all those poor people, and it'll be 10,000 by next Christmas. And the last piece, somehow, we need to engage the private sector. And whether we engage their greed, or the margins, or whatever, but unless they're making money, they won't engage with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McGuinness. Um, we'll take a couple of questions and we'll revert back to whoever feels they're appropriate to. Uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thank, thanks, Chair, and, and thanks to everybody for the, the presentations. I'm interested maybe just in some more comments on, on one specific group, um, which a number of you mentioned, which is the single person households. Um, I absolutely agree with you. The scale of the family homelessness crisis and, and the increase in the number of children has taken the, the media focus away from, from the single person households. But my, my real concern is, is I mean, even with the 50% priority allocations that the Dublin local authorities were providing, almost none of those allocations went to single people because the local authorities don't have, by and large, single person units. Uh, I know in South Dublin County Council, for example, the number of single unit allocations that are made in a given year might be one or two. And that's of all of the lists, not just the priority list. So even in the context, Neve, of your proposal to have 100% allocations, if it's 100% allocations, the overwhelming majority of which are going to be of two, three and four bedroom units, which is, we know, the case in the Dublin local authorities, that's still not going to work for the majority of the long term uh, it's single uh, homeless households that we're talking about. So I'm just wondering, how do we, how do we then deal with that? Um, the second thing is, and it's on the same subject, for those local authorities that are applying HAP, um, clearly for new entrants or for or people coming from emergency accommodation into rental, HAP at least has a higher level uh, of supplement than rent supplement, and I'm not a fan of HAP and uh, uh, would like to see uh, that scheme changed. But the HAP levels for the single person households are as bad as the old rent supplement levels. And again, if, just, if you could comment on that uh, and say, have you experienced difficulties um, with people accessing uh, HAP accommodation on the single persons because of the lower limits for that. Uh, I'll, take, I'll take one more question and you can address the two of them together. De uh, Deputy Butler. Um, thanks, Cahirlach. Um, I would also like to welcome the Simon community in. I met Neve about two weeks ago um, just, just for a meeting before we were sure whether you would get here or not and I was very taken with Neve and her, the work that you do. Um, just two things. I was very taken with the right to housing. Um, I, it was something that struck me that day and you know that you get the people in the houses first and then you have the supports that follow on and you know we've had other groups in this morning they spoke a lot actually we had the Peter McVerry Trust in where 80% to the people um, that they were dealing with for homelessness um, had uh, drug problems and 60% had mental health problems so I'm sure it's the statistics are probably similar for yourselves. Just something there that I'm, you know, we're, we're meant to have our phones turned off, uh, turned off but I'm just getting texts there from my own office in Waterford where a girl is after presenting homeless just in the last hour and she has found a house in Port Law actually where I live myself but um, the problem is the deposit and they didn't, the, the forms are going to take another four weeks to process and she is actually going to lose the house now today and she's going to be homeless tonight. Um, like it's just unbelievable that we're sitting here discussing it and this is coming through on my phone at the moment because my PA is not there and the secretary wouldn't be as familiar with it because she's only new. And I'm just thinking it's horrendous to think that the house is there, the rent is sorted, she can afford it, but she can't afford the deposit, so she's going to lose the house. So is this something you're coming up against the whole time? And I think it's maybe something this committee will have to look at about deposits so that people can get into private rented accommodation. It's so difficult to get a house and then to have to lose it over the paperwork not happening fast enough. Just your comments on that, please. Well, that's a classic example of what's going on. And, I just, I'm, and I'm talking personally now as from the Galway perspective. In the last four months, I have signed the Galway Simon checkbook to pay deposits in advance of the paperwork being done. That was the only solution. So my outreach team came in to me, Bill, similar stories. We've got so-and-so, everything's missing apart from the deposit. The paperwork is going to take. And we have literally compensated for that slow paperwork on the basis, um, with fingers crossed, that the person would get the deposit, you know. And, and it's worked out in each case, OK? But that's, that's a strange way to run a system, OK? Um, recently in Galway, we were told, for example, that um, if you're applying for rent supplement, never mind that it's not going to meet your needs, um, 
um, that it's now 12 weeks for an appointment, or for a, a, it to be processed. But if you're deemed homeless, it'll only take 10. Okay? Well, Galway landlords can wait about 10 minutes to dispose of their property, not 10 weeks. Okay? Well, sorry, where exactly is the delay occurring? Just go back to that. That's well, the delay, th what's happening is that there are... Um, there are arms of the state that are meant to deal with these things, okay? And um, my own, and this is a personal view, is that we're in a crisis, okay? We talk about emergency, we talk about crisis. Now, normally we do different things in those things, but what's happening is the arms of the state are progressing on as they've always done, okay? Now, if you're if you're a person on dependent on rent supplement or HAP payments, which are 30% below the asking rent in Galway, even with an increase, okay? You're not competing on an equal basis. Say, if my son was going out renting and he had the money. Okay. Um, add to that a delay in processing how much money you can bring to the table and you're definitely at the back of the queue. So in a recent survey in Galway say via DAFT, 96% of the rentable properties in Galway were unavailable to people, were, were not accessible by people on social welfare. There has been no social housing built in Galway since 2009, so seven years. So there's an almost total reliance on the private sector to provide social housing. Now, in terms of the model you were suggesting about single people, another example, we got together at our instigation with another housing agency, um, Cope Galway, and with Cluid Housing, and we applied in the last CAS round, okay? We were given 2.1 million to buy 16 apartments in um, Galway, ring-fenced for people in emergency and transitional accommodation. So we, we, and we're still resisting calls, by, and I know the councils are under great pressure, resisting calls from the council to say, could you not put Mary in? She's really in need. We're saying, no, this project was to unsilt, because if you're in a resettlement service for Galway Simon and you can't move people on, then people in emergency services can't move in there. People in emergency services, people on the streets, etc., etc. So one way around that thing is special projects that are, you know, ring fencing money like that. But again, that's not. It's, it's a solution for 16 people, okay, and it'll affect 16 more. The knock-on effect. But some, like in considering what we're doing and the mechanisms put in place. Remember, there are mechanisms that have always been put in place. We also need to reassure ourselves. The government needs to reassure ourselves. The departments need to reassure ourselves that they're working efficiently, okay, and that delay is without good reason. I mean, to say to someone it takes 10 weeks to process your application for rent supplement, forget it, you're, you're going to lose, I'm sorry. Can but, I, you know. can I uh, come back on Deputy O'Brien's uh, comments in terms of the 100% um, the allocations? Absolutely, it's, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It would certainly be... Uh, uh, primarily of use to, to, to families who are stuck in homeless accommodation. Uh, there are uh, other possible solutions for, for single people. Um, one of the things that we did in Cork, uh, again working with um, Focus Ireland and uh, Vincent de Paul and Threshold, we established something called Cork Rentals, which was a social rental model where we stood between the, um, the landlord and the tenant. Um, initially the purpose was so that we could rent the place at uh, the rent allowance level and pay the landlord the market rent, uh, but also take some of the perceived risk uh, away from landlords in terms of working with what can be uh, pe 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 people with complex issues. So we would deal with rent arrears, we would deal with if there was any issues regarding tenancy management and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that was successful in getting a, a number of places. We have about a, a dozen at the moment, uh, which primarily went to long-term homeless people. And between that and uh, the other houses that we have, we managed to reduce long-term homeless every year in 2012, 13 and 14. Last year, the private sector dried up even further. And really, I think there is still some mileage in the social rental model, but it will, it will involve of things like um, you have to be first in the queue when, when a, a place becomes available. You have to make a decision very quickly. You have to have your deposit with you and be willing to pay it. Uh, you have to have a good offer to the landlords. And there's a lot of excellent practice on this that we can learn, uh, not just from Ireland, but from further afield in terms of sometimes you can get ahead by agreeing to pay a bigger upfront payment and that kind of uh, flexibility is essential. The other point I'd make about the single homeless group, while we call them the single homeless group, many of them do have dependents who aren't with them and uh, 
you know, you would hope in terms of the, the, the pathway back towards integration that there'd be a route towards access visits and people would have perhaps two bedroomed uh, accommodation uh, to meet that need. And um, the point that I would make. The vacancy rate is another one. There's 6,000 in Cork, 48,000 in Gre Greater Dublin. Empty flats and apartments, they can be probably be brought into the system quicker than anything else. But the point I would make is that whatever housing comes available, whether it's through an increased allocation from the city councils, whether it's from other social housing providers, whether it's through being first in the queue with the best offer in the private rented sector, whether it's through new building and developments, whatever it is targeted at those who are longest term homeless, and that way you will have the maximum impact in freeing up emergency beds and getting people off the streets. So that's the core thing. Yes, Sorry, you know, I just wanted to come in now. Uh, Dermot has actually made some of the points in relation to single people, but I think one of the areas is also around encouraging local authorities to think about acquisitions, because you know we know the 44% of people who are on the social housing waiting list, so these are 2013 figures, but 44% uh, are single people, so we need to encourage local authorities to start looking at different types of housing stock as well. But I think also the point is that we know that lots of people who are in emergency services and they don't have dependents in their care do have children and so therefore a single unit wouldn't be suitable for them anyway. Coming back on the point that uh, Deputy Butler made in relation to the housing first model, I think we can't speak highly enough of it. The evidence is there. It is a really successful model. It really works well with working with people who have multiple needs or complex needs. You can work with people directly from rough sleeping once you provide them with an approach appropriate affordable home and then you provide the support in that home, it makes a really huge difference. The bureaucracy I think Bill spoke very well about and so I won't elaborate any further but just in terms of the deposit issue, it's a massive problem, it's a massive problem in every part of the country and I think that's a key thing that needs to change. Thank you. Well, uh, well, lastly, one of the simplest ways, I think we're, we, we're all obsessed we're all, uh, and exercised and we're all using lots of resources to describe what I would call the whole elephant. The simplest way of looking at this problem is think of one homeless person, think of your young lady in the middle of this room and say, right, what would she need to be housed tonight? Okay, so if HAP levels aren't at market rent level, she's at a disadvantage, so bring that up. You can't get pre-approval for HAP or rent supplements. So you go out to a landlord and say, I'm about to, you go back, you have to go back to the DSP and say, I found a property. Uh, ten weeks later, you get approval, the property's gone. So you've got to have the right levels. You've got to be able to get pre-approval. These are all emergency crisis sort of measures that can be applied on an individual basis. And while we're all considering the elephant, the elephant is made up of individuals. So every family we get out of a hotel is another solution. And just apply it like that to a human being. Take that personal approach. Um, and that will lead on to instructions to legislation to um, telling departments how this will work, telling providers like us what we're supposed to do. Um, it, it's it's not that complex, to be honest with you. Sorry to death, Sorry. you, Bren, you, um, you asked a question about HAP. I just, would you mind reiterating what the specific... Yeah, no, obviously the HAP limits are different uh, outside of Dublin and Dublin, but in, in Dublin the HAP family rates are, are still quite close to the market rent but the single person HAP rates are substantially lower, so they're much closer to the old rent supplement rates. And I'm just wondering, is that something that you're, you're experiencing as a problem? Um, and have you any thoughts on it? Yeah, I suppose just in terms of the gap between market rent and rent supplement and HAP limits, uh, we do a study a couple of times a year called Locked Out of the Market, where we look at um, market rents and we look at rent supplement and HAP limits. And certainly what we found in our last study was that 95% of the properties out there were unavailable to those on those particular limits. Now, I know there are mechanisms with the Tennessee Protection Service, but that's a Band-Aid. It really is a Band-Aid. And, I mean, if you look at the range uh, across the country, I mean, from 55% gap in terms of HAP and rent supplement limits in Cork, um, it was 44% in Athlone, it was 55% in Limerick, it was 20% in Kildare. They're all really, really big gaps. And unless we look at some mechanism to support people to stay in the homes that they have, we're just going to keep seeing increasing numbers of people entering homelessness. It's already at crisis levels with those 6,000 people. We're just going to see more and more people entering homelessness. Thank you. Asking, does, does that sure. research show a higher gap in, in rents for single people, for, for single room accommodation than for multiple room accommodation? Yes, it does, yeah. Um, certainly, and I can send on the table I have here. Um, it, it basically maps it out. It looks at single person, it looks at a couple and one parent plus two children. We've just singled those out in particular, and we've looked at 11 areas around the country, both in urban and rural areas. And I think the point to make very clearly is in each 
area, the gap is greater than 15%. Okay. Thank, thank Thanks, you. Steve. Uh, on that very point, that um, there is a, a, a special homeless HAP scheme in Dublin where it can go 50% above the limits, and I understand that that, that, that was um, effective in housing well over 200 people last year. Um, the same is necessary in Cork and other parts of the country. I just want to make that point. Thank you. I have a couple of other questions. Uh, Deputy Harty. Thank you very much. Uh, in relation to the prevention of individual single homelessness, if we had better treatments for drug abuse and drug addiction, would we be able to take a significant number of the, two, I think it was 2,700 people seeking uh, accommodation? If we had better treatment services, could we prevent those people from becoming homeless or uh, take them out of the homeless system? I'll take Deputy Coppinger as well. Deputy Coppinger? Yeah. Just um, a, a few uh, questions. You uh, mentioned in your recommendations that you think the government should be much more ambitious with the level of social housing that it's actually going to build, and I welcome that in your uh, submission. You say it should be aiming to build 50,000 social houses. Um, and uh, I, I think that obviously would be the focus of a lot of the homeless agencies. Um, th there's just a few things uh, to query um, in, in your submissions. Um, site levy roll for NAMA increasing par 5 to 20%, uh, those, uh, those things that you call for. Just on the allocation of 100% of local authority public housing to homeless people, I think there could be question in TD's minds whether people are so desperate now that they would actually be tempted to become homeless. Um, now, we know they're becoming homeless anyway, but I'm just, and I, I come from an area where there's mass homelessness, so, but I'm just saying, I think some people, I, I hate to say it like this, but are in more of a position to, to do that than others. Like, if you've got four or five children, you know, to be honest, people are resorting to all sorts of things to try to get a house now. That's, and I'd just like to hear your comments on how that might be prevented. Plus, we all know that there's a hell of a lot of people on the social housing list or on the transfer list in dire straits, in overcrowding. And, you know, they're in as bad a situation as a lot of other people. Um, I think the transfer situation, I'm sure people could testify, is, is brutal. Um, so it's just there's as many bad cases of people who are in houses right now and need to be accommodated. Um, now, that's not your fault because obviously you're saying there should be more social housing, obviously. Um, just on the, the, there's, you mentioned something I, I would have a query about from the point of view of the priority of the housing committee. Um, my own view would be the housing committee should focus on the provision of social and affordable housing. Um, you mentioned you think that mechanisms should be put in place to get private markets moving and building. Um, but I would put it to you, there's no guarantee that any of that private housing will go to certainly homeless people and even to people who are in dire straits in the rental sector, it, it, no guarantee it will be affordable. Um, now, I'm not saying you're laying emphasis on that, but you do make several references to across all tenures. And I think that the, it's just something that is often put out by the government that we just need to increase supply. Well, we don't actually, because there's no guarantee that supply will be affordable. We saw it during the boom. There was loads of supply, you know, but nobody could actually buy any of it. And look at the, look at the state we're in now as a result of negative equity. Um, only 10% will go, obviously, to people on the housing list as well. So it's just in terms of emphasis, I uh, would just raise about that. Another one that you raise is that local authorities should fund approved housing bodies to deliver housing for the homeless. I'm glad Deputy Durkin has gone up to the chamber there. <laughs> but um, <Vote> to... <laughs> um, I suppose I would just have a question about that. The reason being, what I've seen happening lately um, is that local authorities have been sidelined by the approved housing bodies because the government is trying to get everything off balance sheet. The local authority in my area has had to hand over housing left, right and centre to approved housing bodies and um, the, has hardly built anything for five years in Blanchardstown. 
I, I think nothing's been built by the local authority in about five years. And um, again, it's not anything against approved housing bodies, but I think their role now has been way overemphasised, way overemphasised, and it's been done for political reasons and ideological and financial reasons. So it just would seem strange that it's, it's not like the local authorities are sitting on pots of money, or are you saying that they are? And um, the, just the, the other thing is the, the rapid build housing, again, the problem with it is it's not rapid. Like you said it yourself, you're, you're sitting waiting on it for how long now? I mean, if it was, if it was rapid, we, we'd probably be a bit, well, I'd probably be a bit more predisposed to it. But um, I really don't think it's that much more rapid than what you could build longer standing houses, more permanent housing. Um, and I, just the, la yeah, the last one is just this pilot cost rental model that you raise should be piloted. Um, there's not a lot of info in the submission. Um, you make reference to Cork. But from what I've read about those, and I, I raised it earlier in a previous, like, to a previous witness, um, I think from Social Justice Ireland, I would have big alarm bells about that because what's been put forward now is that we should scrap the differential rent scheme in um, public housing, in local authority housing, which is usually between 10 to 15 percent of people's income, in order to get this, you know, uh, um, money raised so that something isn't, um, it, you know, if you set up a special purpose vehicle, the money has to come back in. So there was a discussion earlier on around getting rid of the differential rent scheme, basically to make the rents pay more, right? Now, I, I, I think we could be getting more rents in if the threshold was raised for social housing. I think a load of people would like to go on the housing list now who mightn't have seen themselves on it before. And you'd have more people working, increasing the rents back, etc. But what I've seen of these cost rental models is it's about 70% of the market rent. Um, now, even 70% of market rent to me is far too high because what people are paying now in their income and the, the cost that it's having on their, their families and their lives is outrageous, you know. And I just don't like this idea that the money has to come from the people who get the houses. Like, there, there should be ways of taxing wealth, you know, bringing in extra revenue to build social housing. Now, I'm not saying you're advocating that as the only way, but you might elaborate on that. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. Before I, we have one further contribution, and then back to yourselves. Deputy O'Sullivan. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not caught up in the approved housing body versus local authority. I'm more interested in, in who's going to provide the quality um, housing that, that is needed. And you did say that you're providing more accommodation now. So do I take from that that you're capable, also you have a capacity to provide even more? And what is what are the steps that you for you to do that? That'll be the first one. I also have concerns around the possibility of 100% allocations to homelessness because um, I'm just looking at other people who have been on the housing list for so, so long with really, you know, great needs for housing. And what, what we're seeing at times is people being offered from the homelessness and for various reasons either not taking it or not being acceptable in the complex or whatever for various reasons. It's causing a delay in the place being allocated and we're still seeing you know, um, flats and whatever being left vacant inordinately long term because of that. So I just believe that if something is available and if somebody from the homeless list is not prepared or whatever to take it, okay, you try one more from the homeless list, but then it should go to the other list because we can't leave um, places vacant for as long as they are. So I have concerns around that one. And it's difficult when, you know, the communities I represent are very close-knit, they all know each other, and it's very hard to listen to somebody telling me, um, well, so-and-so, so-and-so, they're on the homeless list, but I know they're not really homeless, and they're getting ahead of me. And it's the fairness and the unfairness I think is really important. And on the rapid build, I mean, I saw them on the site in East Wall, and really, um, I'd go into one in the morning if, I, if that was my choice. But it's just the, 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 the divergence between... I don't think any of them were over 90,000 to build. I think they went from 30 to 70 generally. And now we're looking at what they're costing with all the other costs going in. So, just again, if you comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy O'Sullivan. 
between you there's a range of different issues. You needn't answer each one. Each of you don't have to answer each one, but collectively you can decide which ones, uh, how you're going to I'll approach I'll take a stab them. at some of the bits and thank pieces. You, and uh, I mean, first of all, going back to Deputy Coppender, uh, first and foremost in terms of the allocations piece, um, what we were suggesting is that it would be people who have been homeless for six months or more, so that would be people who are homeless prior to December 2015. So therefore, that would be in place to uh, prevent that, that idea or the possibility that people might then make themselves homeless as a result. So it would be a point in time thing only. Um, look, we're absolutely aware there are people all around the country living in awful conditions uh, where they're, they're sharing, um, they're overcrowded and all of that. I suppose we're looking at the prioritising need here where you know we're talking about whole families trapped in hotel rooms, we're talking about grown adults sharing dormitory style accommodation. So this is very much a point in time thing, but it has to be part of a suite or a number of measures as well, which means stemming the flow of people becoming homeless, which is some of the measures around rent certainty, it's rent supplement increase and HAP increase, it's looking at increasing security of tenure for those in the private rented sector. So we need to stop the flow of people becoming homeless and if we can do that, then if we look at some mechanisms to try and deal with those people who are currently stuck in emergency accommodation and do it quickly, we can limit the impact and the damage. We know the impact on people's health, their well-being, the trauma, the stress and all of that. The longer people are stuck in situations like that, the more support they will need in the longer term to live independently. You brought up the issue in terms of the social housing strategy and certainly we think that there should be much more ambitious targets in relation to local authorities building and delivering social housing. Um, I mean, we would have concerns about the over-reliance on the private sector to deliver, certainly as it's currently um, proposed, 75,000 units will come from the private rented sector. It really isn't uh, sustainable in any way looking at the private rented sector at this point in time. So absolutely we would encourage uh, local authorities to be building and delivering. We very clearly see that the primary role is the local authorities in terms of building and delivering social housing, but the approved housing bodies do have a role and I suppose what we're talking about are partnerships between local authorities and approved housing bodies in some situations. And I know for example, and Dermot might speak a bit about the situation in the South East in relation to the housing and the local authorities. Um, which might give you an example of what we're talking about in relation to that. Uh, in relation to the treatment piece, um, very clearly we do know that drug and alcohol use can be a cause of people becoming homeless. So, you know, obviously it's really important to have access to treatment, rehabilitation, support, aftercare, the importance of people having accommodation to go to after they've entered treatment. But I think very clearly the housing first model is predicated on having no conditionality. And the really important thing is it is not treatment first. It's very much that once people are in a more secure and settled home, the impact on their drug and alcohol use is quite significant anyway. So we know that the highest levels of drug use and the highest levels of risk behaviour are seen amongst people who are rough sleeping, people who are staying in squats, people in emergency accommodation. So very often what happens is once people are in a more stable housing environment, it gives them an opportunity to maybe reflect on their drug or alcohol use. And if you're providing that appropriate support to people, you can have that referral on then to treatment services as well. But absolutely, we need to have a greater supply. We need to have that greater interface between the national drug strategy, mental health strategy, mental health services, physical health services uh, and that connectivity as well to make sure that we're providing uh, for what people need really out there. In relation to um, capacity at a community level, I might ask my colleagues to come back to you, uh, Deputy O'Sullivan, in relation to that. Certainly in terms of the rapid building and, and I also saw the units and I was very impressed by them, I'm not quite sure what happened in terms of um, the delays in relation to that number one, but also in terms of the, the cost becoming greater and greater because I, I know that they were much more reasonably priced, so I'm not quite sure what happened there, to be honest. In relation to the cost rental model, that's a commitment to the social housing strategy. The Department of the Environment have developed the cost rental model. I suppose our argument around that is that we need to see it, we need to get it out there, we need to see if it will certainly work. The big thing about it is obviously affordability and making it more affordable, not only for people who are in receipt of social protection payments, but also people in incomes as well. Just, could I just come in on, on your comment, Deputy Sullivan, um, in terms of allocations, I, I mentioned that the, the project we had in Galway, written into the service level agreement is that if after a certain time period, which is only three months, no nomination comes from someone who is classed as homeless, then the allocation goes to someone off the general housing list, so that can be built in. And ultimately the local authorities have the say on who who, who gets those places as opposed to, say, service providers like ourselves. Okay, so there's, there's no need for it to be exclusive, but you, you also have to remember, say, and I'm using again our own example locally, um, last year Galway City Council spent 222,000 on putting people in hotels. So by definition, those people are the council's priority. 
Okay, they started out the year with a, with a budget set aside of 9,000. And that's just a, a local example of how bad it's got. So it, uh, we're here obviously to represent a certain group of people on the housing list, but by def, by, because of what's happening, um, people who, would be, who are classed as homeless are now becoming the council's priorities because they're spending large amounts of money. And we're also being told, we talk about development each year. We're, there's also a word that you know, the department may have to hold back on 25% of the funding to cope with the emergency. So some of the more long-term solution stuff that we've talked about here today won't, probably won't get dealt with again. I will be a little bit at the back of the queue. Can I come in on, on a couple of points? Uh, first of all, Deputy Harty raised a question about, you know, was the, well, I, I think it was, was there a kind of a link between the uh, quality and extent of mental health and addiction services and the prevalence of homelessness? And there is indeed, and there is, uh, again, very strong international evidence that where you have better services in place, you have fewer people becoming homeless, most significantly you have fewer people falling into that long term homeless category. So that's essential and uh, that's why it's so essential in helping people to exit homelessness that you have the services in place to sustain that. That links to uh, Deputy O'Sullivan's question in, in, in a way I think because um, uh, in terms of uh, local authority allocations um, uh, and the whole issue of whether who provides housing for homeless people. One of the challenges is that um, people who are long-term homeless and have complex needs sometimes have uh, a particular history and sometimes would fall foul of the scheme of letting priorities. And it becomes almost that, that, that you're kind of sentenced to homelessness for past uh, mis misdemeanours or troubles that you've had in your personal life. And um, getting, uh, getting around this and being able to give people a second chance in terms of access to housing and uh, a way forward in their lives is crucial. One possible way uh, of doing this, we, we have seen in Waterford, for example, that, that the local authority has allocated houses to South East Simon for its Housing First project, and that's quite useful. Uh, in terms of who provides housing, whether it's ourselves as approved housing body uh, or whether it's the local authority or whoever. The bottom line for all of us in Simon is that somebody must provide housing for, for, for the people we serve. I know that in Cork, City, in Cork City we get practically nothing in terms of allocations from City Council. A lot of that is because we're working with a lot of single homeless and a lot of the units of tree bed and so on. Um, sometimes it's hard to house people because they have complex issues and where nobody else is going to house them, we will house them. Uh, but I think that measures should be taken to ensure that people have access through social rental models, through uh, direct uh, public housing and through whatever, whatever other means. The priority uh, to address homeless is clearly to house homeless people, especially those who are longest time homeless. I'll just uh, maybe string a few of those questions together. One is, uh, in the Greater Dublin area, there's ne nearly 5,000 people, between 4,500 and 5,000 people, including children, homeless. Now, the number of children is about 1,800. The number of parents with those children is about 1,200. And the number of single adults is 1,800. Plus, if you put the rough sleeper and merchant's key number in there, nearly 2,000. So it is a clear priority that something needs to be done. As Neve was saying, the longer people and Dermot, the longer people are homeless, more issues they're going to have. So in terms of the detox that we have on Usher's Island, the big problem we have is getting people in there and actually getting them out to move on, because there's a shortage of move-on accommodation. I think um, the HSC could our budget uh, going back four, five, six, seven years by 20, 22%, that hasn't been restored. So we're still operating of that and trying to increase the services that we offer. And Neve already reminded me earlier when we were talking about that the drugs initiative was cut by 37%. Now, at a time when the numbers are increasing all the time, the issues and the complexity is going to increase too, because nobody's better off being in emergency accommodation, whether it's private emergency or any other kind of accommodation. So that's not good for us. I think coming back to what would we do more, um, we have presently 100 units in the pipeline now. Okay, and that would probably get 125 people into those. Now, we're, we're a specialist housing association that's part of an organisation that delivers services. And we're not in the big time, we're not providing thousands, right? 
their, their AHBs are capable of providing more accommodation. I think the issue is, obviously, a lot of them have been now approved for, by the Housing Finance Agency. I think land is the issue. And then finding places to buy and purchase. So going back when we started three-ish years ago, four-ish years ago, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit. And most of it's gone at this stage. And in terms of the accommodation, a lot of it, it's hard to find one-bed accommodation. Uh, it hasn't been built, really. Um, and in the two beds, what we're doing is what everybody else does. We're getting people to share. But to get people to share, obviously, they need more supports because you have to get them ready for sharing. Because in other cases, the longer people are homeless, they've forgotten a lot of their skills and domestication and everything else. But that's where we have that SLEE process that needs to be actually pushed out over the rest of the country because it's very much a four local authorities in Dublin. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ran, before we conclude, you want to comment again? Uh, just two very quick points, and just in relation to that whole, I suppose, generalist housing providers and specialist housing providers uh, and the importance of having specialist housing providers, I suppose, working particularly with people who might have a high level need. But there also is an importance in looking at general providers and ring fencing within that in the longer term for people leaving homelessness, people who might have high level needs. And therefore, in situations like that, you can look at you know models like the social rental agency model, where you have a three way relationship between the tenant, the, the landlord and an organisation who can provide the support. And another point I would just make is uh, Michelle Norris from the HFA I know was in earlier this week and she was talking about the fact that local authorities can't currently borrow from the HFA and certainly I mean, that is an avenue that should be explored in relation to finance for local authorities to ensure that they can build more. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Griffin, Kavna, uh, Mr McGuinness, Ms Randall, thank you for your attendance today. Um, your presentation and I suppose one observation from my own point of view as you were going through it, it was very interesting to hear that there were there were perspectives outside of the Dublin area uh, which was you know from somebody who's familiar with the issues in the Dublin context uh, it was interesting to hear the perspectives outside of Dublin uh, thank you for your presentations and as I say your appearance here today we'll suspend for a few moments as we get the next group in thank you very much thank you I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue so to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statement submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting and members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So at this stage of the afternoon, I'm very pleased to welcome Novus Initiatives, uh, represented by Dr. Una Burns, uh, Anne Cronin and John Rogers. As I said at the, uh, earlier, the opening statement has been submitted, will be published on uh, the committee's website afterwards, so it's been submitted to members. But in the first instance, if you'd like to do an opening statement, and then colleagues will have a number of questions for you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Una. Uh, we'd like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to present to the committee uh, today. We welcome uh, the focus approach um, it's taking to the current housing and homeless crisis. And we've already contributed to the Dublin Limerick Network presentation, so we'll try to avoid duplicating those points and just um, concentrate on Novus's. Um, its own experiences. Um, we're a national organisation uh, providing services to families and individuals who are homeless or at risk of homelessness throughout Ireland and we're a tier two organisation providing 217 units of accommodation. Um, our output is focused in the Midwest, Kerry and Dublin. We're the largest providers of homeless accommodation in the Midwest region. Last year we worked with about 2,200 people. We play a vital national role in supporting some of Irish society's most vulnerable households by pro providing a range of preventative services, tenancy sustainment services, supported temporary accommodation, uh, long-term accommodation and drug, mental health and disability services. Um, many of the, our clients are uh, particularly marginalised. They're not served by mainstream um, services or existing um, voluntary organisations and we support our clients around the pillars of housing, health and recovery. 
They're extremely vulnerable, our clients, and they present with increasingly complex needs, including entrenched drug use, intergenerational poverty, poor education, family breakdown, experience of trauma, enduring mental health issues, dual diagnosis, and repeated experiences of the criminal justice system. Um, our presentation today will highlight the current obstacles and provide some specific actions that can immediately, immediately address the crisis. Um, it will encompass both elements of our organisation in terms of our homeless and ancillary services and our ability as an approved housing body to provide long-term um, housing for those most marginalised. And since 2012, we've um, delivered about 170 units to formerly homeless individuals, or um, and about 50% or more than 50% of this was new stock, and the rest was refurbishment, so that um, the vast majority of our clients now have their own room in uh, supported temporary accommodation. And just a few notes on the prevention um, side of things. Um, we um, wish that the rent limits available under the HAP homeless pilot um, above 50% above rent supplement levels are maintained. Uh, we support the extension of HAP for homeless to all urban centres considering it's a national crisis. Um, the HAP provision itself, we um, believe that it should be revised in its implementation. Um, our experience in Limerick um, is that there is a period of time between a household secures a home and when the HAP payment is received. And in some cases this is um, of about three weeks. And at present there is no facility for reimbursement for the intervening period. So a vulnerable household is beginning their new tenancy already in arrears. So we believe that instances where this is happening, there must be a reimbursement facility for those households to ensure that they can um, engage properly in the process. Um, if for households in receipt of rent supplement, we believe these rates should be increased. Um, and that this, um, that any um, increases are not sufficient without the implementation of rent controls linked to the consumer price index. We believe that nobody should become homeless because of the gap between a household's income and rent demands. And we know in some cases as CWOs exercise discretion in increasing these payments where there's a risk of homelessness but it's not happening across the board and particularly our intensive family support service at Limerick is responding to cases where people are presenting at risk of homelessness and they've already gone to their CWOs, they've been denied the increased payment and they're going to be made homeless and I suppose through our intervention we've managed to um, get them the payment but we think that this discretion should be applied in all cases where there's a risk of homelessness. Um, and particularly though, when the risk is driven by economic uh, reasons. Regarding the Tenancy Protection Service, it's um, doing immense work in Dublin and Cork and we believe again this should be extended nationally. And um, something we've been campaigning for a long time is a, rever a reversal of the reduced social welfare payment for um, those under 25s. We think this is um, paramount and we do kind of view this as discrimination in its, in its current state. And overall in terms of um, prevention, we believe that um, by redirecting resources to preventative measures, we will reduce the number of households entering temporary and emergency accommodation, which is very expensive and really has poor outcomes for everybody, particularly for families. Just in terms of housing, then, um, we support uh, the development of new housing, of course, and that this um, development must have mixed stock particularly concerning one-bed units, which um, any DAF search will indicate are nigh impossible to find for people on uh, rent supplement or HAP, and that this needs to be taken into consideration. And I suppose in Ireland, 75% of current households at the moment comprise of three individuals or less, so any new developments should reflect this. We uh, advocate for speedier turnaround of vacant social housing units and that any existing ones, and we know that this is getting narrower and narrower, but that the, the refurbishments are, are taking place quickly. And I suppose in terms of other stock that's not social housing, that looking at the housing agency's report, I know that mo this was 2011 and a lot of it will be gone now, but just to have a look in the places of most need, what can be refurbished, because this will turn have a quicker turnaround than new developments. And at a local level, um, Stephen Kinsella, he's a lecturer, a senior lecturer of economics in UL, recently reported that 30% of stock in Limerick is vacant, so we need to look at this at a local level. That would uh, seriously improve um, the situation at, uh, there. Um, we say support that more social housing needs to be available for housing first and tenancy sustainment um, projects. Again, in Limerick at the moment, there's no social housing available for these um, projects and we're entirely dependent on the private rented market, which doesn't make it easy. But um, on this point, one thing that would help is discretion by the local authority around the provision of market rent for single individuals in two-bed apartments. Two-bed units are very often a better option for single individuals, particularly single individuals of very complex needs. In terms terms of the nature of the house being an independent unit rather than in a complex would make it much easier for those kind of people to, to have better outcomes. 
again, the availability of these properties are, um, is better than one bed units and the potential access that such clients might have to their children. And it would free AHBs like Novus and like Cluid and those to purchase two bed units for single occupancy use if we had that reassurance. Um, just another point that we added that we don't have in your um, report there. In 2014, the implementation plan of the state's response to homelessness recommended that the Department of Social Protection review the current scheme of accommodation so the rent uh, supports would be attached to the person rather than the property. Considering the support needs for such individuals, the maximum rent limits can be exceeded where there are special housing needs, and this includes homelessness. However, unfortunately, this recommendation was never acted on, on at local level, and we'd urge the committee to revisit this point, which was actually 5.5.6 uh, um, in, the, in the plan. Um, to ensure that it's enforced on the ground as it would make the development of long-term housing for people with particularly special needs and complex needs um, more economically viable and also with that, that money the, we could provide wraparound services for these people to ensure that they um, are successful in living independently. We support no reduction in funding for emergency accommodation um, while we're completely committed to housing-led um, approaches that at the moment I suppose that demand is exceeding capacity in all SDAs and in Limerick in April Novus SDA services um, only 25% uh, of those that presented were able to access accommodation so I suppose that just highlights the need for it. And the cyclical nature of the housing crisis is exacerbating the situation in emergency accommodation services. Clients are bed blocking because of lack of move on accommodation and therefore very vulnerable individuals are not able to access the service at all. Um, we've been providing low threshold accommodation services in Limerick for 14 years now and already there's a very clear pattern of intergenerational poverty and, and neglect. I suppose while this is not unique to Limerick compared to our services in other regions of the country, it does appear more intrinsically ingrained and we recommend interagency research around this so we can start providing very focused evidence-based solutions. And just um, a last point in housing, um, we really encourage a recognition of and development of targeted solutions to rural homelessness. And just to give you an example of one of our um, areas where we work in Thurlis last year, just 4% of those that um, were uh, referred to accommodation services accessed accommodation. So like 96% of people were turned away. And this year, the figure is 94% having been turned away, so we really need to look at that. Just this week, on the night of the 24th of May, there were 17 adults and 13 children in bed and breakfast accommodation in North Tipperary alone. So I suppose, while the, the concentration and the density is in urban areas, there needs to be just a recognition of the rural, um, the rural landscape as well. And very often, um, I suppose, uh, local opposition to social housing projects and stuff can be more intensified in rural regions just to the nature of the landscape. And this needs to be recognised. And I suppose the, the support of local councillors is um, fundamental in getting these social housing projects across the line. So that would be another recommendation we'd have there. Just in terms of CAF, we've just a small few recommendations there. Uh, we're a homeless charity with the ability to develop new stock in the form of long-term housing for homeless people. And just some small structure changes to the current vehicle would enhance our ability to do that. So just a few things we'd propose. Front-loading accelerated CAF payments of the 30% so that it, um, the timeline is reduced in the delivery process. And again, if we debunked the administration of the CAF system again, we feel like this would um, reduce the timeline. Um, we've experienced um, some difficulty in accessing CAF for, new, for group homes, so we would um, encourage the extension of the CAF facility to this as well. So just these are kind of some things that could be changed easily that would make a big difference to the provision um, in terms of AHBs. And um, finally in this uh, note, um, the delivery of new bills outside major urban centres is challenging due to the revenue available to service debt and overall cost of development. Cost of development includes VAT and where applicable site acquisition. Measures that would reduce cost, um, such as VAT, the cost of land, or getting increased access to state land, would significantly assist in increasing output and the potential to deliver housing in locations where re rental income currently doesn't make it viable. And just our final point, but it's uh, extremely, we consider it ex uh, vital um, in the integrated approach to supporting homeless people, is the additional supports that they need. Um, we would uh, encourage integrated and on-site mental health services for homeless people. And um, the, ment uh, the Partnership for Health Equity uh, report, which was uh, published in September last year, 
highlighted the significantly poor state of the health of homeless people compared to the general population. And um, if we kind of look at having uh, more supports on site, then we believe that this would um, improve their, um, their overall success in moving out of homelessness on a long-term basis. And we believe that HC budgets need to be reinstated to 2010 levels to provide the support, and we consider this vital as well. Um, wraparound mental and general health services should be provided to housing first clients seeking to live independently in areas outside Dublin because we're again we're finding this difficult at a, at a regional level. And finally, in terms of just the supports um, that um, in the Midwest region uh, we we support um, a kind of a community dedicated community midwife for some of the pregnant women that are engaging in our services. Many, some of whom are entrenched in drug use. Um, me, many of those are coming back to our SDA services um, the day after having babies with no specified support or specialised support. So we would encourage that. And I suppose just because that was our last point uh, in terms of the additional sports, it doesn't undervalue how important we consider these um, these sports to be in um, providing um, exit strategies out of homelessness. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, a number of colleagues have questions. We'll start with Deputy Butler. And thanks to the committee for coming today and giving us your presentation. We've had this is our fifth presentation today now, and, and, and some of them are, you know, the, 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 there's underlying trends in all of them today. And I'd like to welcome the fact also, like like the last um, presentation from the Simon community, that even though the worst problem is definitely focused in Dublin, it's a nationwide problem, and it seems to be getting worse and worse, you know, everywhere. And I welcome the fact you're from the Midwest, Kerry, and and the and you cover the Dublin areas as well. Now, just in relation to more um, a rural problem, I, I represent Waterford, which is urban and rural. And what I find sometimes that people who are living in the rural areas, they find it hard to access the supports because they don't want to move their children from the particular schools they're in. They may not have transport. And in most cases, they would have to move into the city to access the supports. Whereas, you know, it's causing a huge problem. And I presume you, you, you see that the whole time also. So um, the question around, you mentioned that you think a two-bed approach is the best. Quite a number of the agencies I have met and who have come in here, um, a lot of them are floating the idea of the bed sit again, the one bed, bed sit. Um, you know that there's a lot of single people homeless who may not have um, children, uh, you know, and I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Do you, do you think there's merit in, in, in the bed sit, um, properly functioning bed sits that are up to standard, of course, you know. Um, another question around HAP, you, you, you put a lot of emphasis on HAP. Now, I've seen HAP work and I've seen it not work, you know, and where it's working properly and the landlord is cooperating, it's, it's a very good system and the landlord is paid direct. It is actually rolled out now in, like, I know it's in Waterford, it's in Kilkenny, it's in, it's in quite a few areas and it can work well, but there, there are faults with it as well. And finally, just to ask you, you spoke there about calf payments. You've just might explain what CAF is. Is it a governed body for AHBs or? It's, uh, do you want to take that? Uh, CAF is, 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 is uh, one of the two primary funding schemes. It's capital advanced leasing facility uh, and it's effectively an element of a subsidised loan from the um, housing agency but the bulk of it is, is private finance via the AHB. Thank you. Do you want to address then the? Or, or, sorry, Deputy, are you finished? Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to address the issues? Yeah. Um, thanks, Deputy. Regarding your first point, um, the I suppose the difficulties that families experience in rural areas whilst um, accessing services, and I agree with you that issue of children in schools is a huge one. And we we have um, we have a couple of tenancy sustainment services. We've one in West Cork. We've one in Limerick. And it does come up quite a bit in terms of offers of housing. And I think it is quite a legitimate concern that families have. And I would, our services would certainly support them that those offers of housing need to, need to facilitate the children stay in the same schools. And I think we would often um, support families in making those decisions because I think when a state of flux is there, I think the one, you know, those kind of constant things like the um, being able to go to the same school, have the same um, group of friends, the same teachers, that they're vital things that, you know, keep families together and keep children um, that sense of security. So I think it is a very valid point and one that we would often see in terms of tenancy sustainment services and we would support families around. The bedsit issue, I suppose, 
I would be concerned around a return to, to bed sits. Um, I think by their very nature there is this element of this idea of maybe small, very inappropriate types of accommodation and I think you know across our urban centres we have quite a lot of maybe old kind of run down um, pockets of accommodation which would formerly have been bed sits and I think going back to that model wouldn't be ideal but certainly we do need something to replace that because I think what we have now is an absolute dirt of one bed units, one bed houses um, and I suppose it is because of a lot of the bed sits were put out of action um, and we absolutely need one bed units made available um, to single people. But in the meantime, what we're asking for, the same as a lot of other organisations, is the two beds are used and that we can actually place singles into two beds and the market, the, 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 the gap in the market rent is, is, uh, is supported by the local authority. Um, it's the only, it's one of the most feasible kind of solutions we can come up with in that there does seem to be availability of two bed houses, two bed units, depending on the, the urban centre you're working in. And if they're available and we need to place one single people more than anything else, then I think